Hello and welcome to this edition of EdTech Mondays Africa. So many innovations have come out of herbs on the African continent, like this one here at Noshkin in Kigali, Rwanda. And education technology has now taken the shape that one cannot talk about education without talking about the technology aspect of it. But the question still remains, what is it going to take? Who are the key players who need to drive this strengthening and building resilience of our African edtech ecosystems? My name is Joy Doreen Bira. Welcome to our August edition of EdTech Mondays, where we are speaking to our EdTech Mondays country partners from six African countries. Allow me to introduce to us our panelists on the show. We've got Origen Ijiraneza, who is the chairperson of EdTech Forum here in Rwanda and he's also the Chief Executive Officer of Genius Panda. We also have Jennifer Cotter Otieno, who is the co-founder and Chief Executive Officer at EdTech East Africa, based out of Kenya. We also have Arthur Mukembo, who is the lead at the Future Lab Studio at the Innovation Village in Uganda. And we do have Chinenlu Akpa, who is uh, the practice lead for education at the Co-Creation Hub or CC Hub in Nigeria. We also have Olufemi Adeumi, also known as Femi, who is uh, the Programs Director at MEST Africa in Ghana. We have with us Radiat Meshesha Kasa, who is the Supervisor and Host of EdTech Mondays Ethiopia. It's so good to have her with us as well. And we are going to be taking contributions from our audience who also happen to be stakeholders in the EdTech ecosystem. And we are honored to have them as well in our audience. And so how exactly do we build an EdTech ecosystem across the African continent, one that works for us? Of course, we have started the journey, but more needs to be done. And that is why we're having this conversation. So if I just might start by posing the question to Chinyalu, who is from Nigeria. Chinyalu, I want to hear from you. A lot of work has been put in, uh, not just my CC Hub, but all of us here. Um, but then are we content? What exactly is the current state? How do we assess the EdTech ecosystem in Africa today? EdTech in Africa has come a long way. Before now, EdTech was seen as something that was very vague. You know, it was, there's a lot of secrecy and mystery around edtech, you felt, people felt they needed big devices, big tools to make edtech happen, you know. We believed we couldn't learn away from the classroom. So when you think about edtech, you're thinking about something very germane, maybe more uh, particular to the Western world. But then COVID happened. Before now, there wasn't any research going on in edtech. You know, we weren't even attracting funding. But next to fintech, you know, edtech is attracting a lot of funding to the African continent. Um, so all of these things are happening and people are saying that edtech is the next big thing. So people are now collaborating. You know, people are saying, how can we come together to synergize, put together our expertise, put together our efforts to make edtech better? So how do we build better products? How do we ensure that um, um, schools and other edtech stakeholders are able to uptake all the amazing things that we're building. So people are no longer working individually. Um, I can reach out to a colleague in Uganda and I am learning, there's this immersive learning going on in EdTech. The same is true for Ethiopia. So uh, my sister from Nigeria already stated that's an infrastructure issue. We have that too. And then in Ethiopia, we are only like having this EdTech technologies, these solutions only in the universities. It's been just two years since uh, uh, license is granted for the higher education so that they can give their uh, classes online. That's also like that shows how we are back. Uh, so we are still working, we are struggling, we are trying to catch up, but we still have a lot to do because uh, we're not concentrating on the elementary uh, part of the schooling thing because uh, we are only on the higher part of it, which brings like the digital gap between the generation, right? So students from rural areas, uh, they are still struggling to uh, cope up with students with, from uh, urban areas. So universities are like using the edtech uh, solutions and then students who are coming from rural area, 
they're struggling to cope up with the urban one. So the digital gap is still there and we have a long way to go. We have so much better evidence now than we've ever had before. Um, previously, all of the evidence around ed tech was coming from other places. And over the last few years, in terms of the local research that's being done about what works for our students, our teachers, our parents here on the continent, um, and really research that's being done by local African researchers or institutions um, focused on what works in context. So for learners in rural areas versus learners in urban areas, using different types of technologies, making sure they're culturally relevant, um, all of the things that we know add up to really great learning. Now, all of a sudden, we have more evidence than we've ever had before to help inform us having a conversation about how do we all move forward together. Uh, I think that's a very interesting point because it is a, a similar case to Rwanda, where uh, when uh, we started EduTech Mondays, we were just as uh, uh, EduTech entrepreneurs who were discussing about what's going on in the ecosystem. Then when COVID hit, uh, EduTech became another uh, interesting topic for many organization stakeholders. But then what happened, just to build on what you said, uh, last year when uh, uh, ICT Chamber and the MasterCard Foundation came together to do a very comprehensive research about the edtech landscaping in the country. It was amazing to, to see the facts that came out of there. And then what happened afterwards was bringing together all these actors to now discuss who is doing what and when, how can we get all people together to move the edtech into the uh, like the best future that we want it to be. Yeah, maybe I'll take an alternate view. Um, while a lot is happening, compared to other areas where we're having technology disruption, edtech is still where we were behind. If you compare with FinTech, for example, there's still a whole lot of opportunity for edtech. Uh, and if you imagine that the um, market is huge, probably bigger than fintech, the fintech market, then it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't know what to say, it's surprising that people are not just jumping in to take advantage of um, this huge opportunity. I think maybe this is the awareness problem we're talking about, um, for us to create awareness, for people to see um, what is really, really the potential in this space. I think what I also find interesting is COVID also came as a catalytic event but found that already certain steps were being taken to enable interesting use cases like EdTech to flourish, right? Uh, in Uganda alone, for example, we've got over 4,400 kilometers of fiber optic cable that's already been laid across the country. And now the goal is how do you extend that to literally the village level uh, to enable last mile access, at least at the infrastructure level. But if you're extending infrastructure and there are no use cases on top of that, then you'll not get a return on that investment. Um, and so what we've seen EdTech doing is it's a great use case uh, that's going to be used on a daily basis, can be used on demand, so on and so forth. So how do you now begin to build interesting models on top of that, which is why we like the fact that now we have our own evidence in the local market context, evidence we can compare across regions on the continent. We're seeing language issues coming up, so on and so forth. Um, and so I think it finds us at a point where right now it's a case of finding sustainable models, but the case for EdTech has been demonstrated and it's manifested in multiple different ways. So it's an exciting time to be in the space. We've heard our panelists talking about use cases, sustainability. Femi mentioned something about lingering opportunities that we need to tap into, but do we get a sense of direction when we are talking about EdTech solutions for Africa? I think we're still trying to figure out how to do it. There's a lot of um, opportunity, but um, uh, the sort of thing that um, we're doing with EdTech Mondays is just one of those ways where uh, we're trying to figure out that direction. There's a lot more that needs to be done, a lot more conversation with policymakers, with parents, with stakeholders that need to happen to actually chart, um, chart a clear path to uh, bring it EdTech up to where it should be. I want to borrow Lee from your book um, to say that whilst we want to grow, it would be in a bad place if we want to come at EdTech with a one-size-fits-all approach, right? There has to be individuality whilst you're still working together 
you still need to understand. So that's where the place of research comes in. There has to be heavy research done, but still working with other people to know what is happening around you, then building for your market, building for your country. So if you're thinking you're going to sit down in Rwanda or you're going to sit down in Uganda and build something or come up with models or policies that would reflect across Africa, you're digging a pit that is going to, you know, swallow everybody in. So it has to be very individual, very intentional, plenty thought out, a lot of research. And thank you for the power of data right now. You need to keep testing and find models that fit. And even within countries, you'll find out that even in one country, you have various models that will fit um, various categories of learners and use cases and the rest. So that's how I want to say it. Yeah. And I'm really kind of picking on top of that is you're already seeing multiple efforts to try and figure it out. Uh, anytime a sector is becoming mainstream, uh, is that you, you tend to find people trying to figure out how would it work in my context and then how do I play into the others. So already education ministries across Africa and really in many places in the world were shocked at how unprepared a lot of them were when the pandemic hit and now we suddenly have to decide do the kids not study at all? Do we quickly adopt this? You know, So in, in the Ugandan context, there were efforts around using radio, uh, for example, using TV. And then if you're using TV, you know, who teaches? Uh, do I have five different people doing the mathematics training or whatever not? Then you had X number of startups coming up with learning management systems and the same kinds of business models and whatever not, right? So a lot of things were tried out and, you know, that pandemic bubble helped us to do rapid prototyping and whatnot. Where we find ourselves in an interesting conundrum is which ones of those can be proven to be staying or, or, or sustainable per se, right? And that's where policy innovation becomes uh, critical. But policy innovation cannot exist outside of market systems because then you'll end up having interventions that require the hand of public money for them to be sustainable, which in that case is not going to ever reach uh, the critical mass, the critical level of adoption that we needed to reach. So I think uh, as we think through the ed tech opportunity is that how do we think through market driven initiatives that are able to catalyze effective demand for these things, uh, tackle issues around access, gentrification as you continue to be able to uh, drive adoption so that no learner is left behind, but most importantly, that do not disrupt the learning experience of uh, the young person. I think for us that remains very, very critical in what we're doing around ed tech. So we have to also give the ball to the government because like in Africa, governments are like more powerful institutions, right? So uh, while like doing the policies and strategies, they have to also uh, enable startups so that they can scale up, right? So we have these startup companies, students are doing air tech solutions and everything, but they are not being accepted by the government offices, the teachers and so on. So the government has a very big role to play because it's a, one of a powerful institution in Africa. So we should also give the ball for the government and then entrepreneurs can like p pick up from there and then do their things. And I think that collaboration, oftentimes we think it's just saying the word, let's collaborate, right? It's an easy thing. But the reality is the practicalities of collaboration are actually very complex. And understanding the diverse stakeholders that operate within an ed tech ecosystem. So you're talking about everything from power providers, grid or off grid. You're talking about connectivity and hardware. You're talking about policymakers, you know, implementers on the ground, NGOs, community-based organizations, the entrepreneurs, media, all of our diverse stakeholders and everyone operates on different paces uh, in different ways. And so understanding and creating transparency and clarity around how those different stakeholders actually operate, the cycles of their work and giving our ecosystem members, you know, the empathy to understand how to be agile and to work together more effectively, I think is, is part of what we as ecosystem builders aim to do to allow that collaboration to happen more, more seamlessly and so we can all move faster together. I think we were, at least in Rwanda, we've seen that happening and working. I remember when this EdTech Monday started, some of entrepreneurs were complaining about uh, the issues they were facing, which were limiting them to get to the final, uh, to the end users. But what happened as one of the opportunities after these conversations, when we were bringing people together, these people are getting support. We have uh, testimonies of uh, like uh, uh, 
uh, contracts being signed. We've seen uh, recommendation letters being uh, written to uh, some of the entrepreneurs to go to the schools to try out their solution. So there is that uh, already uh, movement move, uh, happening. But then uh, what, again, we've done uh, in, the, in the previous year was to identify these needs, these various needs that are faced by different uh, stakeholders. And then from there, we wrote recommendations. These recommendations were like policy recommendations. We wrote recommendations about the product and services. We wrote a recommendation about the edutech company support, which might be needed. And it even went beyond to procurement. How could people procure for the edutech solutions? And this is where now comes the next conversation. Whenever we are coming together, we'll be like, now let's design a roadmap of how do we address these issues. And then there we can put an accountability mechanism and say like, we said like by this time we'll be doing this and that where we at, who have done what. I like the direction this conversation is taking. And before we even come to that one phrase that need not miss in strengthening an African edtech ecosystem, let me throw this conversation to the audience, hear from them, what do they have to say? I really wanted to add in on um, the actual opportunity that exists in edtech. Um, I think the important perspective we need to have is um, um, African families have a limited amount of expenses that they can really afford to, to, to put in. And usually the challenge in, 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 uh, in launching and running um, a technology solution is you're fighting with a limited amount of expense from food, rent, um, but that's not really the case usually for education because African families really care about um, education and education expenses are really lie and you know one of the top three expenses after food and, and, and rent. So that gives us a very much bigger opportunity than other um, tech solutions um, because already um, families are quite really invested in. And I think it's very important um, for regulators and tech entrepreneurs to really understand this a much bigger market um, and really approach it from, from that perspective. And I think the market is really already open and, 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 and investing in, in your kid education is already um, uh, something that um, families are already convinced. So um, I think we really need to get that perspective and I think that's the, you know, we, we don't really always realize how, how critical is that and, and, and the market is quite much more open um, comparing to other tech solution. Uh, look at entertainment, could be even FinTech Usually they can be an option. So once that's limited, you know, it's usually very challenging for, you know, families to actually really put that extra amount of money to, to but that's not the case for education. And that's, that's very important to be recognized ac across the, um, the stakeholders. There's also another aspect, which I know all our partners on, on the stage today have considered, we've got to follow them with this. But I think the industry generally starts from a very technical point of view of uh, edtech, you know, what will be a really swan, swan, you know, swanky app? How will it be you know, like looking on the screens, etc.? A lot of times we ignore one major um, key player that helps in adoption of edtech, and those are the teachers and the teaching fraternity. Too often we don't take into account how easy is it for you to understand this and kind of be either deployed in the classroom, or how do you see this students, learners, or even parents using this uh, to advance learning. So that, I think, is a very critical component that we should never forget. The teaching fraternity, before you write a single line of code, run the idea by teachers. Otherwise, it's never going to be adopted. Antone from Ethiopia has talked about the cost of education, but he's also mentioned that African parents actually are intentional about education for their children. But there seems to be a missing link. Let's speak to the missing factor. I mean, and indeed, uh, it starts from first principles. EdTech is not a magic bullet. Uh, it's part of a mix of pedagogical tools and different other things that you're doing to equip the learner at the end of the journey. And a lot of that agency is entrusted in the teacher uh, who also has certain constraints. Oftentimes, public sector teachers are paid late, underpaid, paid in installments, so many other issues that they face. So there's already a motivation barrier 
with the many, many things that this teacher has to overcome before they even leverage EdTech to be able to pass on learning to the, uh, to the student. Then you have the actual learners themselves who are in environments that sometimes are not conducive, so on and so forth. There's a lot to fix. But if you take a market-driven approach, it's that find the inefficiencies that already exist and figure out what's the one pain point I as an entrepreneur, I as a solution provider can speak to and how do I elucidate other actors along this value chain as to where the rest of the opportunities are or where I see other constraints or challenges or whatever. Notes so that together, it's a concerted effort. I think the more we begin to communicate learnings and what we're finding along the way, the more you build market transparency that then encourages these kinds of innovations to come to market. Um, so EdTech Monday, for example, as a platform does that. It's that convene people who are picking different slices of this challenge and have them articulate what's working, what isn't, what they wish could be in place for them to do what they do better. And the more we have these kinds of conversations, the more other actors then pick interest and we give them the platform. Before you know it, you've built a very vibrant ecosystem that's passionate about making sure that this is solved. Maybe we start there. For us to keep in mind, I think EdTech Mondays does a really good job of focusing on how do we make learning inclusive for everyone. So how are we thinking about technology that enables learning for refugees, for learners with disabilities, um, for girls who are often left behind? And so thinking about inclusion as a kind of first principle, right? How are we empowering our entrepreneurs to understand universal design for learning? How are we encouraging the funders in our community to you know, allow our entrepreneurs space and resources to ensure that they are able to design products that are central and, and uh, designed for those different types of contexts, different learnings, uh, learners. And so making sure that we have the space, uh, the ability to test and design things that actually make sense so that we're not just designing for one type of learner, but all of the learners in our ecosystem. What does testing really look like in this context, really? I think it means literally going to the ground, talking with teachers, talking with learners, talking with parents, and listening properly, taking the feedback, being agile, and adapting. I think, you know, entrepreneurs, this is one of their superpowers, to be honest. Um, they're really great at taking in information, taking evidence, and transforming the way that they work quickly um, and, and trying out something new and not holding a lot of ego in the design of their products and tools. Um, governments tend to have a different type of scaling process because uh, of a lot of factors contribute to this, but they, they have so many more learners they're serving. So, you know, you might do a small pilot, but then immediately you're required to scale to millions of learners across the country. Um, and there's less of that kind of agile development. And so this is where collaboration between different members of the ecosystem can be so powerful because it allows us to take learnings from that agile process, contribute that into a more, you know, at scale learning system so that every learner becomes more served better by the innovations we're actually creating. So I was going to talk about um, bureaucracy. Um, education is heavily guarded by the government across Africa. So whilst we think, you know, there's, there's so many exciting things we can do, and I spoke about in the beginning how, yes, education in tech in Africa is growing, we cannot take the conversation away from the foot of the government. And this is government across Africa. And I particularly applaud the MasterCard Foundation because they held the ministerial forum two times now. And what they did was they brought in, you know, education stakeholders, ministers of education, they spoke about, you know, education. So we need to get the government to speak about education and get them to have that buy-in. When they get the buy-in, it solves another problem, funding because edtech is expensive. It's really expensive to build for edtech. So people would not ordinarily want to go into edtech because from the time you're building to the time you make profits, it's, it's a journey. So by the time you see that the government has bought into this, the government is willing to fund, the government is opening up and taking away some you know, bureaucratic bottlenecks that you ordinarily have. You can't really just go to schools and the rest. You know, people who genuinely want to bring in money to fund people who have these ideas now have the confidence. So investors' confidence is established. Then the support comes 
in funding, in collaborations, and we see better products. We see better ec tech ecosystems growing across Africa. It's true, air tech is very expensive, but it's never a luxury, right? So we're not, uh, when we say schools, we're not thinking about walls and blackboards anymore. So we can deliver uh, content to students, especially who are in a rural area through uh, some air tech solutions, right? So I think some of you are uh, familiar with the hole in the wall thing. So I think that happened in India, right? So. Uh, there were these learners, uh, rural learners, and then uh, this person put a screen on the wall, and then they were coming there and then grabbing contents and everything. They were given an exam, and then they were able to score uh, with the formal students, right? Right, like they were scoring. So um, it is expensive, but it's not luxury. So we have to start now. We're, we're lagging, but we have to really, really start now. Uh, I think what, the, uh, what I wanted to add on is just uh, creating a conducive environment for edtech to grow. And this uh, means uh, from the policy standpoint, how do we uh, create uh, informed policies that you know, allow uh, edtech companies and edtech solutions to uh, plug in. And then we go to the part of the demand and supply being matched. How do we make this happen and then unlock the market to the edtech product? After that, what we will again need to do is to make sure that all the people who are involved into the ecosystem are playing their particular role in making it happen. We, uh, that will remove the barrier of repeating efforts or re make, making similar things everywhere. And then uh, gradually we'll reach two underserved communities will reach to uh, these people with uh, special need, and that's how we'll be able to create a vibrant ecosystem. If I may add, we also have to work on skills. So Mr. Suraj from the audience, he was telling us about the teachers, right? So some teachers in Africa are being reluctant because they have a lack of skills, right? So uh, most of us are not familiar with the devices and everything, so we have to also work on the skills. Skills on the teachers, skills on the parents and students, so that's also our another homework. If I may jump on uh, what was just said about underserved, what drove the innovation in the fintech space was a lot of, a lot of conversation around financial inclusion. So maybe we need to bring the same similar conversations into education about educational inclusion. And when those, that discussion was going on, um, startups try, started trying to solve problems with financial inclusion. And so similarly, I think we can do the same thing with education. And um, once that becomes mainstream, the startups can then be supported to scale. Now, once, the, once you have two, three startups that really grow big, everybody will jump in. So I think this, 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 this is what we might want to look at. All right. I love that there's a conversation that's ongoing about uh, you know, the costs, the funding. Um, Chinyalu talked about how hard it is to fund EdTech itself. And also, just talking about the digital skills themselves, it's just a whole other expense. But even in the expense, at least we know that there are success stories where investments have been made and results have been gotten. And I think I want at this moment to bring in Suraj again, just to talk about some of the programs that the Mastercard Foundation has been able to fund in terms of fostering and building um, a, a resilient edtech ecosystem that currently helps us as well at the moment. One of the things we're aiming to do is improve the gaps in education as perceived by governments and by uh, other education stakeholders. For edtech to thrive, it has to be demand-driven. And as somebody has said, it predominantly in Africa, the schooling space, the learning space is from public schools, which is a government domain. So the government needs to buy into the idea of edtech as an improvement for learning outcomes. So we kind of bring together the various stakeholders, as uh, Chinielu has mentioned, we've kind of done convenings, but we actually connect people together. And we're seeing there's actually demand of, uh, from governments to say, this is not something we'll do alone. We do need private sector. We do need development agents. We do need all the stakeholders sitting together to see who's going to do what part. That said, it's also our belief that the solutions to the problems and gaps we see uh, in education right now need to be built locally. 
And so very much in favor of building an African edtech ecosystem. And we're doing this in various ways. One of it is a fellowship program through tech hubs in countries we capacity build innovative edtech solutions uh, through a little bit of a stipend, uh, business development, thinking through the science of learning on their products, and then connect them to the government to show what can be achieved. But besides that, we also work with governments, with regulators to make a more enabling environment for those edtech to thrive. But then you take a step out as well and look at all of that happening. We also need to address policy. And this is where we've started to work with partners like World Bank. We've got the uh, call for action from at least 12 ministries of education across Africa from last year saying we've learned some valuable lessons during COVID. How do we turn our education system into more resilient hybrid models of learning so that we not only overcome shocks like the pandemic, but we also are now going to try and get education to the hands of those who couldn't even make it to maybe a bricks and mortar classroom previously. So we're working with the World Bank on thinking, helping them think through, support them in developing policies that en will enable more um, hybrid models of learning become education become more resilient all right and and you know over the past few months we've been talking about digital literacy as a crucial component to 21st century skills and throughout these conversations we've cited reports that have indicated nine out of ten uh, children below the age of 10 cannot read with comprehension and having to have digital literacy as one of the components to use to improve all of these uh, learning curves I think that specific episode was basically around foundational literacy and numeracy and how we can improve that using edtech and, and and I think much of that is what uh, Suraj has said as well in regard to building and supporting the edtech ecosystem so the future is here the future is now and everyone keeps saying you know in the next five to ten years we should have done this in the next five you know 15 to 20 years we should have achieved XYZ in terms of an edtech ecosystem but then again, that future is here. So where do we start? Where do we go from here? How do we even assess and measure the kind of impact that EdTech is having today? I see a future where uh, young people don't need to sit in four walls to learn, where they can learn from their mobile phone or their um, VR headset. I like that, right? Because then it's even more accessible, right? Especially as the unit economics actually come down with scale. Uh, over time, uh, a lot of opportunity there, a lot of opportunity in harmonizing at the non-tax and tax level optimizations that we can do. Uh, for example, in certain markets, you're taxed for the airtime of phone credit, you're taxed for the data you're going to buy to be able to access this service, and then you're heavily priced at the data point for you to be even able to consume. So from our perspective, harmonize what you can from a tax and non-tax perspective to create a fair playing ground for everyone to start to innovate. Then we build the market systems from there. I see a future for EdTech in Africa where we build our own skills. So we have a lot of homegrown skills for EdTech and we no longer import knowledge. So this um, talent gap is being heavily filled right now. So I'm giving another two, three years, we're going to be having our own homegrown instructional designers, our own homegrown UI UX designers, our own homegrown, you know, whole field in edtech. So you have people who understand the business and the science of education and can collaborate, come together to put all that energy and expertise into building world-class products for Africa. Our kids are innovators, right? So they're trying, they're touching, they're making things. So we're not going to be technologically dependent anymore. So in the future, we'll be innovators and then we'll, we will be the owners of the technology itself. Even now, there's a big debate in the education ecosystem about the role of AI in education. And I'm sure we're all having those discussions in our markets. And, and one of the biggest pieces is making sure that African developers, AI developers are at the center of that conversation, African data, 
is being used, uh, when, when you know, responses are being generated by AI, and that we have an opinion. Our ecosystems are at the center of that conversation, making decisions about how and when and uh, that AI gets built and used, and not just for AI, but for all of the technologies that are coming forward. As somebody who's coming from the private sector, to me, <laughs> I see the future of uh, seeing multiple a uh, unicorn edtech company rising in the future. And uh, it is possible. Yeah. If today we are seeing uh, the gap that is here over a million, over a hundred million students out of school today, this is a huge opportunity. And in the next uh, few years to come, like uh, in 2035, the Africa population will grow by 50%. So there is immense opportunity that is coming. And that's where there is opportunity for business. Opportunity for business, you said. Let's have some contributions. I see Natalie um, has some contributions to make. Uh, I think historically, um, the teacher has been the source of all the knowledge. And so through empowering the young people with digital, digital skills to access that knowledge, then you're in a sense shifting the power and in the hands of the young person, which will lead into and be some sort of reverse mentoring. This is no longer a teacher teaching you. It's in some cases the young person knowing more and then re rethinking the role of a teacher in a classroom, maybe as a facilitator. So the overall impact is to really improve the education sector. My contribution would be is first of all to commend the efforts that have been done in EdTech Monday so far, but also to make a suggestion when it comes to standardizing uh, the solutions that are being produced. Technology is only on the rise; is on the rise, and young people are getting access to these tools. But how are we making sure that these solutions are targeting specific needs in the community? At the end of the day, I can create a solution. You can create something. But are we specifically addressing something that is going to impact the community? As we're thinking about the future is to think that technology is not homogeneous. Technology does not look the same for every context. While we are talking about, for example, AI in very urban contexts, there's very many contexts in which that is not a conversation that's necessarily happening. And even if it's happening, it's still too far removed. So how do we still, as we innovate, carry everyone with us and design for inclusion and equity. The critical point that I really want to echo is um, fundamentally when you implement the technological solutions, you, um, we're already seeing there's a digital gap, which means there's a segment of society that have um, a better access to technology, internet and devices, and there's a, a society that is, doesn't have. And when we look at that, we really need to look at women, one, to, um, uh, again, rural uh, population. And some of the trend we've seen, especially, for example, in fintech is where um, significantly there's uh, around 80 to 20% usage, which are really you know, leaning towards men and, and women really are using these technology solutions. So when we look at what is the type of future you, we're looking at for, for edtech as well, we have to make sure as we push for edtech that we're not really increasing the digital gap but actually reducing and really are intentional in terms of the outputs and then the product that we're building. And, and, and overall, that all the solutions we're building are actually accessible not for only people that have um, a better access to device or better access to internet, um, while that's still good and while that increases the you know, quality of education, but we have to make sure we're not living of people that have less less access. And, and, and I think the, the really the bigger point and overall on that is, um, do we have, are we building an a tech ecosystem that actually reduce um, the digital gap that, that we have seen and we can learn from other sectors that quite, quite progressed. And I think that's very, quite important. The future is here and we keep talking about what we need to do over the next five years, what we want the future of EdTech to look like 15 to 20 years from today. But let's talk about assessing, measuring the impact of EdTech for it to inform what more needs to be done. Uh, I think number one, area to look at is to revise their policies because we've been seeing policies that are not friendly to edtech products so once those policies are revised once they have crafted a way to unlock the market where uh, we can have more products tested out the other thing is about creating sandboxes 
to edtech uh, solutions it's something that has worked at least in fintech industry it is possible to edtech as well so those elements will again bring to a component of collaboration where we bring all these multiple stakeholders together to discuss and uh, shape the vision together and to work with it i'd say three words research funding skills um we have a lot of universities in africa so can we begin to channel energy to support the professors the doctors and all of those people in academia to run extensive research on what we need and how what we can do to support edtech in our countries right and the government knowing that whatever is going to come out of this research is going to be adopted by them next funding can we put in more money more budgets you know back in for education budgetary allocations for education and finally skills we need to build skills we need to support people who are supporting people to build skills edtech is a present edtech is a future so we cannot exclude ourselves selves from edtech so we it's not an option it's a necessity so we have to think like that we have to have that mindset i would say evidence based decision making so generating that evidence using that evidence to collaboratively come up with how are we taking our work forward and really just building on that is pilot the more you're in the market with actual teachers and learners the more you're going to learn stuff that you can pivot and be able to scale up what works scale down what doesn't mm-hmm. um and then is to then pick those learnings and put them in a market context so that these are sustainable solutions with or without government intervention and the opportunity is vast they can work yeah. and that will say scale up education inclusion using technology so as the future education models that are preparing our young people for dignified and fulfilling work for today and jobs of tomorrow that needs to be our north star why are we all in this room what is it we're here for we're not here to i mean yes it takes is a proponent to get us there but that really should remain our north star and how do we do that where education systems are open to change given the fast pace of work that's changing and so policies need to be a lot more adaptable but education needs to be very inclusive not leaving anyone behind in terms of equity in terms of gender in terms of disabilities in terms of displaced people and creating these environments where learners parents teachers look forward to using education because it's fun it's innovative it gets learning and understanding deeper and better rather than saying because there are gaps we're using technology let's flip it and the last thing i'll say is l- everyone let's not look at technology as this behemoth that we have to adopt it really is a tool to improve education it is a tool to improve education and that's just where it is and i think one of the other points that stuck with me is the fact that before our innovators even start to write any kind of code there needs to be some consultation collaboration looking at what exactly the needs are there can't be any meaningful innovations without consulting the people who use the tool as an implementing uh, approach towards education and so edtech needs to have that sort of collaborative effort for us to make it a, a success and so to our speakers for today i want to say a big thank you and i believe that with the thoughts that have been shared here uh from our edtech mondays partners who are also key stakeholders in the edtech ecosystem i believe we have a goal on where exactly we need to go in terms of building um and bolstering as well as strengthening an edtech ecosystem that works for us on the african continent but at the end of it all benefits the millions of learners as well as the teachers who are the implementers of these innovations With that kind of conversation we just had with all our EdTech Mondays partners from six African countries, I'm sure you can tell that the solutions that came out of there from funding to financial inclusion to developing with equity and inclusion in mind and so much more, we can all agree that the future of Africa's EdTech ecosystem is in the right hands. My name is Joy Dorin Bira. Thank you all for joining us from Rwanda's capital Kigali here at Noshken Hub and until the next edition bye bye for now <laughs> <laughs>